Will you turn with me to the book of Matthew? Matthew. Matthew chapter 9. Switch microphones here. Test, test. Awesome. Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to be in verse 18. As you can see, our let's pray for the children today. Father, bless the little children today. Be with them. May your revelation be there. And may they learn to praise you all the days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. also want to um, just say that uh, Shelby and Mackenzie weren't with us this morning. Uh, we actually sent them as a church to a worship conference over in Minneapolis. And so they were there. They're actually, pray for them. They're on their long train ride home. They'll get in late tonight. Uh, it's 23 hours on the train. So that's an interesting journey. So they're actually on the train. They got on last night and we'll be back this evening. But uh, just thank you for your faithfulness in giving to the church. We're able to do that. Because how many of you know it's about equipping the generation? And we were able to send them to that uh, that conference over in Minneapolis. It's actually at North Central University where my daughter attended college and they put on a big worship conference and they are just coming back from that. So I'm excited to hear what God did during their time there. So let's stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, today there's healings. I wrote on my notes, healings galore. <laughs> uh, Jesus just goes through a healing spree and uh, we catch the middle of that story. And uh, so today we're going to focus on just probably one particular part of this, probably one of the more famous parts of this, of this journey, of this healing. And, uh, and, and we're going to focus in on that, though there's many others. Uh, we're going to focus on, on just one, but we're going to read all about those healings starting in verse 18. And then we're going to take time just to focus in on one of the healings that really is a defining point for the rest of the healings. And you know what? Can I tell you something? I'm believing and I've been praying for healing uh, for each one of you. Uh, over this past week. You'll see that the altar is wonderfully decorated this morning. And we're going to be talking about what that is and why it's so important. And uh, some of you may have never have heard this. Maybe some have. Uh, but today, I, I believe in such a thing as that God's going to, going to do some healing, uh, maybe relationally, maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe spiritually uh, today. I just believe that he's going to do something. But let's read these and let let us, let the word of God, spoken aloud, build faith. Amen? Amen? While he spoke these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is now even dead. Come lay your hand upon her, and she shall live. Isn't that an awesome declaration? Come and lay your hand on her. She will live. Jesus arose and, arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood for 12 years, everyone say 12 years, wow. came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. And for she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I'll be made whole. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said to them, give place. I want to say this, and I'm not preaching on this today, but that's an important word. Give place. Remember, they're, 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 and I'll just say this real quickly. They're, they're already mourning. They've already got the things going on. They've already given all up hope, and he says, give place. How many of you know miracles happen when we give place for God? He says, spread out. Give some spot for me to do what I'm going to do. And that's what he says. Give place. I love that word right there. Give place. For the maid is not dead, but she sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in, took her by the hand, and the maid arose. That's what happens when we give place for God to do the miraculous. I think that's what happened this morning. We gave him place, and he shows up. Man, the world could, could really use some place. The world really could make some space for him. Amen? Boy, the world could just make space. If you don't hear anything else this morning, never get so tied up with what's going on in your life that you don't make a place for him. That you don't give him room. Father, help us. And when Jesus departed, there's two blind men that followed him, crying, saying, you son of David, have mercy on us. And come into the house, and I want you to know he didn't stop there. 
Did you note that? It says, when he was coming to the house, the men came to him and said, and, and men came to him, Jesus said, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. He touched their eyes. According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that no man knows this. But they, when they had departed, they spread abroad his frame and all, fame in all the country. And they went out, and as they did, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb man spoke, and the multitude marveled. And we've never seen this in the land of Israel. But the Pharisees said, he cast out devils through the prince of devils. Boy, those religious people. <laughs> Father, this is your word. These are the miracles of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. And Lord, let faith build. Lord, I believe there's those that are in need of healing today. There's things that have latched onto them that they need something new. And Lord, I believe today miracles will happen. By the reading of your word, by the preaching of your word, and by the faith of your people, we will see the miraculous. And so, Father, if it's a relationship, if it's a healing, if it's an addiction, if it's just something that someone's struggling with, I pray today that faith would arise, hope would arise, and heaven would meet earth, and there'd be an encounter of the miraculous today. In Jesus' name. Let our hearts be ready, our feet ready to go forth. And God, help this preacher to articulate your word carefully according to your will in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning, turn to your neighbor and say, I need a miracle. I want to talk today about not giving up. Now, of course, I didn't spell that wrong. <laughs> it was purposely, but you're going to find out why. How many of you know sometimes, even as we sit here this morning, we yearn for the miraculous, but in some ways, parts of us have given up. Maybe we haven't given up fully on the Lord. We haven't given up completely on what... He says he'll do, but there's parts of us that just say, you know, we've tried everything and we wonder, are we going to make it? I, I don't know if I can believe God for that anymore. We become disillusioned. We, we, we kind of get discouraged. And, uh, and in that, we feel guilty about even the way we feel about the Lord. But today I want to talk about a story about a woman that just did not give up. I want to focus in on the woman that pushed through the crowd and said, if only I would touch the hem of his garment, I would be healed. And, and I think about that story, if you look at other gospel uh, on the story, other accounts, it says that she spent her living on trying to get healed. She, 12 years this woman has been suffering, 12 years. We have a cold for four days and we think we're going to die, right? And so this, for 12 years, this woman suffered with this infirmity. It says in the Bible that she saw it, all the physicians, she'd done everything she could, and actually it says that she had pretty much used up all her funds. All her finances had been used up trying to get healed of this thing that was going on in her body, and she could find nothing. How many of you at that point, you're, you're poor now, you've sought every help you could, and how many of you know when you're sick, when you've got something going on, you go... You do anything you can to be healed, right? You, you'll seek after things that you wouldn't normally do. How many of you know sickness sometimes changes our viewpoint? Sometimes sickness changes our belief value. And so here's what I'm saying today. She is to a place now that she's not only poor, she's used up all her resources, sought after everything that she possibly could. Now she's also considered unclean. So here's the fact. She's now considered unclean. She's not even, she can't touch anybody. She's not even supposed to be around people. 
So she's come to a place for 12 years. She's pushed aside, probably discouraged, probably uh, depressed. She's an outcast and poor. Great combo, right? I mean, this lady, if anybody was going to give up, maybe she would be the one that would. But you know what? Something happened that day. Something stirred in her. Something, she started hearing about this man from Galilee. She started hearing about this rabbi that miracles were going to happen, that were happening. And something that his life was starting to line up with some stories of old. Maybe something that her father told her and maybe her grandfather told her about one that was coming. One that was going to bring healing to the nation Israel. And you know, something got a hold of her heart. Something says, I've got to try one more time. Something's inside of her says, it's not time to give up yet. There's a rabbi there, a man from Galilee that I've heard stories about. And i got to push through. You know what? They, she had to push through the crowds. She had to touch a man that she was not allowed to touch. She was not meant to touch people, not be in the crowds. And she says, it doesn't matter what people think of me. I'm going to push through the crowds. And if I could only just touch the hem of a scar, I might have a chance. Amen. But what was it? What was it that pushed her to that place? What was it that said, I will not give up? What's, what was it that made her say, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I might be healed? What was it that caused her not wanting to give up? What was her final hope? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to give you some history and some thoughts of what that is, and not just information today but something that would stir up your faith to say, you know what, I'm ready to pursue, I'm ready not to give up, I'm ready to go after it like this woman, to push through the crowds, to push through people going, you shouldn't be out here, and to do what other people said you can never do, don't touch that man. I don't know about you, but I want that faith. I want to be able to push when I don't feel like it. I want to be able to push through the crowds when I don't feel like it. I want to push through what other people think of me. Because I need something. Some of us still sit back worried about what people might think and you're suffering from something. you got something going on and you don't want to push through your crowds. You don't want to let people know. You don't want to even be seen out in public. But there is something that stirs faith that says it doesn't matter. i got a need and I know the one that's got an answer and I'm ready to push through. I'm ready to come out of my house that's trapped me. I come out of a situation that's got a hold of me. Push through the crowd. Push through what people think of me and get to the one that has the answer. You've tried everything else. But what was it in this woman that said, I'll come out from hiding. I'll push through the crowd. I've tried everything else. I'll give it another chance. What was it? What was it that pushed her that day? What was it that made her go through? She said, if only I could touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. What gave her that idea? You know what? This was a growing trend. Did you know that? Look at these passages. Don't put your Bible away. I want you to go with me on a journey today. Look at Matthew chapter 14. Go there with me, if you would. Matthew chapter 14, verse 35. Matthew chapter 14, verse 35. When you're there, stomp your feet. Four of you. <laughs> verse 35. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him... They sent out on all the country round about and brought into him all that were diseased. And they besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as so many as touched, they were made perfectly whole. This seems to be a growing trend. They're yearning after touching the hem of his garment. And they heard about him, so they brought others. And they reached out just if they could only grab the hem of his garment. Look at Mark. Go to Mark uh, chapter 6 with me. Mark chapter 6. I'm going to go to verse 56. Mark chapter 6 and verse 56 it says, With wherever he entered, whatever village he entered, or cities or countries, they laid the sick in the streets. So he's showing up, and all of a sudden, people are just laying the sick out in the streets. Jesus is coming. The man from Galilee, the rabbi, is coming, and he heals. Let's just get the, maybe we'll just put a sick man in front of him, right? That's what they're doing. Yeah, maybe they'll just run into him. And so uh, that they might 
touch, if it were, the border of his garments. And as many touched, everyone shout touched, they were made whole. This is an interesting phenomenon going on. They all yearned to touch this part of the garment, this desire to lay hands on this garment, this part of the garment. But for most of us, uh, even common readers of every day, we read along and we just think that that's like, uh, like my wife's dress today. Maybe if I just catch the, the corner of that garment, I'll be healed. If I, and, and some people have interpreted just maybe if I just touch a piece of his clothing, that wasn't it at all. Culturally, that was not it at all. That word in the Greek is very interesting when it talks about the hem or the border of the garment because that same word in Greek, how many of you know what the Septuagint is? Does anybody know what the Septuagint is? Let me, tell, let me give you a little indication. Write this down. This is important. This is a key thing in, in, in interpreting Scripture. The Septuagint is simply this. A bunch of uh, rabbis and scholars got together and they determined to take the Hebrew passages of the Old Testament and write them in Greek. Now, why is this important? Because it gives us indication of how we can take Greek and also line up the Hebrew. So the Septuagint is important because then we have Greek in the New Testament, which I've got my feelings about that, but there's a Greek in the New Testament. And so if we take those words and we understand what those 70 did to write the Septuagint, they took the Hebrew scriptures and put them into Greek. So now if they use a Greek word for the same Hebrew word, we know that that Hebrew word works in the New Testament, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how that works? So if they used a Greek word for a Hebrew word in the Old Testament, that means the Greek word they, that the scriptures use in the New Testament gives us indication of what the Hebrew was or it takes us back. Guess what? That hem or border of the garment in Greek, the Septuagint, the, the, the rabbis, uh, when they took the Old Testament and they went back to Numbers chapter 15, the word for tassels, or zitzit in Hebrew, zitzit in Hebrew, the same word, in, and we're going to go there in a few moments, the same word in the Greek when it says the hem of his garment or the border of his garment, they use that same Greek word in the, in the, in the Septuagint to define the Hebrew zitzit or fringes. Same word. So this word in the Greek, when they talk about the hem of the garment, the Septuagint writers use that same word to define the Hebrew zitzit. Now you might wonder, what is that? Well, you see this lady right here? I, I scrunched the picture down. But you'll notice that she is grabbing on to a, a, a tassel, uh, to something more than just a hem. And so let's go and find out what it is. What is this word? If this is Greek word is used in the Old Testament, let's go back and find out where it's used. Because ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know something. Here's Here's what we do. We sometimes grab on to what the Lord is saying, but there was a reason that she went for the border, and I want to give you the, the biblical example of why would a woman... See, sometimes we think in, in our culture today, if I could just grab the coat of this guy. No, 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 there's something deeper, and this gives us indication how we have to chase after the Lord. I loved the interpretation of the tongue today because, in essence, David did not know what I was going to talk about today, and he, what we find today is a story about chasing after. But why did she say, if only I could touch the hem? There was something brought as a young child that she understood would happen. And I want to take you to the scriptures to do that because I want you to grab onto the same miracle. I want you not to give up. So let's turn to Numbers chapter 15. And I want to show you something that is very interesting. Now, today, because of time and... and uh, I, I always get called long-winded as it is. I won't be able to talk about all the ins and outs of what, these tassels and these zitzits today. There is so much to talk about, but we have a short amount of time. And so I'm just going to give you the faith basis of this, not all the information as a whole. But why did she grab it? I'd love to take time and tell you about all the tassels, how it came about, all the scriptures, everything to deal with it. But I think what we're going to find today is enough to build your faith to go, I'm not giving up. I'm going to go after him. So Numbers chapter 15. We're going to be in, in, uh, in verse 37. This is where God gives a command. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel in Numbers chapter 15, verse 37. Speak to the children of Israel and bid them that they might make fringes. That's the word zitzit in Hebrew. That Greek word in the New Testament 
is the same Greek word they would have used for this word here when they did the Septuagint, when they translated this into the Greek. So here's what I'm saying. Ladies and gentlemen, the woman was grabbing after this command, grabbing after what was made here. It said, make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. Everyone shout throughout. throughout. And they put a fringe on the border and make it a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that they may look, everyone shout look, upon it and remember, shout remember, remember, all the commandments of the Lord and do them, shout do them. And they would not seek after their own heart, their own eyes, after which they used to go a whoring. That you may remember and do all my commandments, be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So right there, God says, I want you to make a fringe on the corner of your garment. I want it to have, I want it to be on four corners of your garment. I want you to put something on there. Now, if you read the story right before that, a man has gone out on the Sabbath and gathered sticks. Now, you were not called to do that, right? If you know the law, the Bible says that on the Sabbath you're to take rest, not to do any work. He goes out and gathers sticks. He's judged because of it, and God goes, okay, all right. How many of you have ever tied a knot on your finger to try to not forget something? Have you done that? Or, uh, okay, here, modern day sticky note. You put it on your forehead so you won't forget, right? I'm going to put it on my mirror. I'm going to put it on my mirror in my car. How many of you have ever done that? You've put, I mean, those yellow sticky notes come in handy. I do in my office all the time, like on uh, certain days, I write a sticky note and I stick it right where I won't miss it. Right on the computer, right on my keyboard somewhere where I'm not going to, well, this is what God did. God said, I'm going to give you a sticky note. He says, I, because a man was just, was just essentially judged for picking up sticks. And he's like, dude, I just gave you that commandment. And you're out gathering sticks. He's like, I don't want you to forget. So he says, I'm going to tie a little knot so you don't forget. He says, I want you to put these on your four corners of your clothing. I never want you to forget what I've done. I never want you to forget my word. I never want for you to forget I am your God. I'm going to dress you differently so you always remember you're my people. You're going to have a mark on you. You're not going to dress like everybody dresses. I'm going to put my word on your heart and in your life. And I want you to never forget. And I want you to wear those around you. Always. So they made these clothing. Should I put all four on? You guys ready? That's it. I'm going to do it. So. They made clothing, and on their clothing, now, it's changed over the years, and I can't give all the history today, but they made clothing that would have on the four corners these ties, and they would be on the robes and on your clothing, and, and, and they would be worn, so everywhere you went, you had these on you, and that you would look down, and you would be reminded that you're no longer your own, that you're a people of God. That you're not dressed like the rest of the world. That you have a mark on your life. How many of you know when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're no longer your own. You're no longer like the world. And he says, you know what? I want to make you a kingdom of priests. Did you know in the book of Exodus, in chapter 19, he says, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. You know what priests do? They declare the glory of God to the people. And he says, I'm going to have you dressed like priests. I'm not going to have you dressed just like the world. I'm going to have you dressed like priests. So wherever you go, you're declaring. And the, and the, and the Bible talks about these tzitzit as a declaration of who God is. You might ask, what's the ribbon of blue and all that? Well, too bad. I don't have time to tell you. Because you guys are sitting there going, we start early to be done early. Can I tell you, let me just share this. The ribbon of blue is about royalty. It's about the sky. It's about the declaration of who God is. And if you'll note, it's, the word is tekelet. Everyone say that? Tekelet. Tekelet, the ribbon of blue. The ribbon of blue is a rare thing. I can't get into all that. But I would say that the tekelet, the one fringe, the one, the one that is colored, that is called the shamash. Everyone say the shamash. 
Shamash means servant. It's the servant one that keeps the rest of the fringes together. Here's what I would say. These are knotted together. The ribbon of blue is the main one. It's the servant one. It keeps the rest together. And can I tell you, if that's the declaration of who God is, what God is saying in these fringes is you need me. Tie yourself up. Not your life in mine. Be wrapped with me. I'm the only thing that's going to hold you together. Never forget that. Listen to what he says at the end of this. You wear these. You don't forget. Look at how many times he says, I am the Lord. I am your God. He says, I don't want you to ever forget. So when you're walking around, no matter, I want you to know it, it doesn't matter. Turn to the east, there's one. Whether I turn to the west, there's one. All four corners of your body, no matter where you go, you take the word of God with you. You take who I am with you. I am the Lord, your God. It doesn't matter which direction you go and what ends of the earth you go. I am always with you. So he says, put those on, your garments, so that you would look upon them and remember my commandments. That fringe, again, the tzitzit is that Greek word. Look. Remember. When you look at that, remember who I am. Remember the word I've given you. Remember you were once a slave and now you've been made free. Look at how it's knotted together. Look at how I put a ribbon of blue in there to say that every part of your life has to be wrapped in me. The word of the Lord this morning, the interpretation was, make it all about me. Don't go chasing after anything else. Remember the ribbon. Remember the tassels. Wear them. And they had clothing that had all these on. And they'd have undergarments that had these on. And here's what I love about this scripture. I want to share it with you real quick before I go on. It says this. Do them that you do not seek after your own heart. You know what that word really is in Hebrew? Capture this word. It says that you would not spy into your own heart. Isn't that interesting? Because when we spy into our own heart and look into our own heart, how many of you know it sometimes leads us astray? And he says, if you, it's all about focus. It's about perspective. If you've been to the Holy Land, you'll watch Jewish people hold these and rub them as they pray. Because they realize their whole life is tied together with the Word of God. That everything that they are is Him. We're knotted together with God and life without Him we're not a people. We, we were once not a people, and now we're a people. We're priestly people. We're declaring the glory of God. Some people say, I could never dress differently. I could never be differently. You know why the Jewish people have been tortured for so long? It's because they're willing to wear what God told them to wear, no matter where they go. And you know what? They stand out because you know why? They live differently. And ladies and gentlemen, our walk in Jesus Christ is none, no different. We're meant to look different, walk different, be a people that is declaring the glory of God. May praise be ever on my lips. Amen. And God says, I know you'll forget. How many of you are for forgetful? Come on, every hand up now. And God says, I want to tie something on you that you not forget. And that's going to be on your clothing. Don't forget. This became a mark of his people. Let's keep your hand in numbers. And we're going to come back there, I believe. But look in Romans. And I want to show you something that is very, very important. Why would God do that? Make sure you remember. So when God does something he does it for the purposes of blessing when man does something it's about bondage men and sometimes man has taken what god has asked and it's become a religious thing these tassels and that's not what it's meant to be i'm still wearing them so i'm good to go <laughs> hopefully be shaking them around romans 120 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood, 120 of the book of Romans, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power and the Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You might say, Lynn, what is that saying? It means simply this, God does things in the physical realm to help us understand spiritual realities. He says, you're going to forget? Let me make you something physical that you always remember the word of God. I could take you through every knot, every strand, and tell you how much this tells about about the word of God and how much you were to look on it and remember. And God is saying, I'm trying to give you physical things so you, you will not forget because you will. These physical things on your body are representing spiritual realities that are true, but you'll forget. So I've got to give you something.
this connection to God was very important. These fringes became pretty much a part of the lifeblood of the Jewish people. Everything that they did, this was a part of them. You'll note later in life, later in the scriptures, common man didn't always have these fringes. Uh, the, the, as they became more of a nation, uh, more of the rich had them. Um, there's, there's important aspects because there's, there's uh, two different uh, uh, fabrics that are used, and that teaches us a lot and all that. I don't have time to do that today, but remember the story of David and Saul? Remember how he's getting chased, and David's going to be in this kingship. And, and one of the things that happened at the time of kings uh, most only the kings would be wearing tassels, uh, and that promoted who he was. And the larger the tassels uh, kind of became a big deal because it showed more authority, more of a position. And so uh, that's why Jesus starts talking about that a little bit later in his ministry because, again, that was a man-made thing uh, that was taken off. But at first, kings would wear these tassels. Remember, uh, Saul goes into a cave and David's being chased and you know the story very well but Saul goes into the cave just to explicitly say he's taking care of business he's got to go to the bathroom right so scripture's clear he's got to go into the cave to go to the bathroom but he happens to go into the same cave that David's in so what's David do he goes up and it says that he cut off the corner of Saul's garment he didn't take him out but he cut off the corner now listen to what David says it, it says that the Bible that uh, that his heart was smote for conviction, that all of a sudden he was convicted. Now, most of us would look at it and go, what's the big deal? He cut off a big, a little piece of his shirt. What's the big deal? But it's deeper than that. He cut off the corner, his connection to God and his royalty. Do you see, David cut off this fringe. See, Saul's sitting down taking care of business. David comes up and takes off a corner of his garment. All of a sudden, he cuts him of his kingship, his connection to God, his clothing, his, his distinction of a God-given person. He cuts all that off. Why does David's heart smote him? Because he all of a sudden cut off the connection to kingship and power and God's connection to him. And here's the interesting part. You know what Saul says? This is so cool because most of the time we just pass through this. Here's what... Saul says, surely the kingship has passed from me to you this day. Why would he say that? <laughs> because David was holding this. <laughs> Physical things showing spiritual implications. Saul knew that. And he goes, surely the kingship has transferred this day. Isn't that awesome? Sometimes we pass right by those scriptures, but it, Saul saw his tassel in the hand of David and knew that his power and authority had been cut off that day. Wow. So we could go on and on, different reminders. Uh, even, get this, even the woman at the well, Jesus, the woman at the well, he, she comes up and all of a sudden, how does she know that he's Jewish? Have you ever asked yourself that? Have you ever asked yourself, did Jesus wear tassels? That's what I'm asking you this morning. How many of you in this room believe Jesus wears tassels, wore tassels? He's a Jewish man. He'd fulfill the law. He was Jewish through and through. How did the Samaritan woman know that he was Jewish? Because she declares it. You guys don't have anything to do with us. How did she know that? He wore tassels. See, we read right through that part of the story, and we don't take into account that there's no way. He didn't say he was Jewish. He didn't say that he was different, but something gave him away. The tassels. He wore tassels because he was a Jewish man, and we could go on and on and show how all those things happen, and you'll note that they're all knotted and put together for a reason, and, and Jesus, now at that day, Nowadays, we have prayer shawls and different things like that. People have shirts, undershirts that wear these. Some people have the, the, the clips on the belt, different ways that that happens for Jewish people. Back in that day, it would have been a garment that they would have wore. It would have been part of their uh, uh, garments. And so when Jesus put on his garments for the day, it would have naturally had the ties on it already. His garments at that day would have been longer. And so when you see pictures like this, when his tassels are lower than they are today, that was pretty standard. Their robes were longer, and his tassels would have been closer to the ground than they are now. 
And so he's walking along, and he's got these tassels on him, and so that's how that's changed. Now they have them mostly on prayer shawls, and, the, and some of the rules and regulations change over time. But back in that day, it was part of your apparel. You threw it on. It was a part of who you were, and Jesus would have been walking down the street with these tassels close to the ground. Now, I want you to note in something in Numbers chapter 15, verse 38, Speak to the children of Israel and bid them that they might make them fringes in the borders of their garment. This becomes very interesting because how many of you know the garment wasn't the important thing? What was the important thing? It was the fringe, but the fringe had to be attached somewhere, right? So it says, make it in the borders. Here's what I want you to know today. That, that word borders in Hebrew is the word kanaf. Everyone say kanaf. 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 The word Kanaf can mean outermost, but it actually bears witness with the word wings. Here's what it says. That you might make fringes in the wings of your garments, the outermost corners. And that became what was called kanaf. Everyone say that again. Kanaf. kanaf. Everyone clap their hand like this. Kanaf. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Kanaf. One, two, three. It's just keeping you awake is all. So, The word kanaf is wings. Everyone shout wings. So God says put these fringes on the wings of your garments. Let me sh share a scripture with you that happens. Psalms chapter 36. Psalms 36. Psalms 36, and we're going to go to verse 7 here. Before you look down at it and read it, here's what happens. A Jewish man, today, I just want to take today, because remember, Jewish people keep traditions for years and years and years. Jewish man of today will take his prayer shawl, and he'll don it in the morning. He'll take it, and he'll put it on, and he says a special blessing from his siddur, from his prayer book. <laughs> And they'll have the tzitzit on each side. This particular passage of scripture is actually many times embroidered on the face plate or the, the forehead part. Because he'll wear it over his head or over his shoulders. And he usually puts this on a couple times during the day. He'll say that particular scripture out loud when he puts it on. I want you to know what he says. Psalms 36, and again, embroidered in those tallits that you'll even buy. Some of you may even have them. How excellent is your... Loving kindness, O God, therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Do you know what just happened? They're donning this. It's embroidered on the front of this thing. And they say, oh, how excellent is your loving kindness, O God. As they're, <laughs> they're wrapping themselves in this garment. Therefore the children of men... They grab their tallits, their tzitzit. They put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Now, kanaf is wing, which attached the tzitzit, which was a memorial to God to declare that he is God and you are his children. And every time a Jewish man or woman puts that on, they say, we take protection under the wings of you, O God. We take protection knowing who you are and who we are. We take protection in knowing your word. Remember, what's it say? When you look at it, you'll be reminded that I am your God, and you'll be reminded that I have a plan. Some people say it's just the commandments and do them. No, no, it's deeper than that. You're getting the wrong idea of God. Some of you need to change your view of God. You think that he's a big dictator up there, and he's saying, I am the Lord your God. No, he's not. He's saying, I am the Lord. There is no other. You have nowhere else to go. I am the one that will deliver you. I am the one that has a great purpose for your life. And I'm not keeping you from things. I'm pointing it to you, your destiny and what you were created for. Wrap up with my garment. Don't forget who I am. You'll be protected in my word. You'll be, uh, in, you'll be enwrapped in my presence. I'll take refuge in his wings because it's in his word that I can stand. And I will not be moved. 
Your loving kindness is good. I take refuge in your word and who you are and what you created me to be. Wings. Now let's continue with that thought. Let's look at some more. Think about the wings of God now. The wings of God are what? The tzitzit, that are a reminder of who he is. Listen to these passages in a new light. Psalms 57, 1, I know you've quoted these and you've declared these and shouted them. Think about this for a moment. Psalms 57 and verse 1, it says this. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. Yea, in the shadow of your wings, I will make refuge until these calamities are long past gone. Here's what he's saying. I'm going to hold on to your word. I'm going to wrap myself in your wings. I'm not going to be moved because it's your word that I trust. These calamities are trying to tell me something different, but I'm going to hold out under the wings of your protection. Physical things to provide us with spiritual realities. God says, my wings are my word. When you take refuge there, I cover you with my promise. I cover you with who I am. I cover you with who I'm declaring you to be. I cover you with my faithfulness. Let's go on. This even gets better. Psalms 91. I have five minutes to wrap it up. You think I can do it? Psalms 91, 1 through 4 says this. You have quoted this in your time of trouble. Everyone has. Listen to it with the idea of the tzitzit and the tekelet and the shamash. Listen, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High will hide, abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome of the pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you shall trust. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You can put your faith and your trust in his word and who he is ladies and gentlemen there's a lot of things coming your way there's a lot of things against you but these things were made to remind you don't move you know that guy one time years ago he went out of his tent on a sabbath and he started gathering sticks and thought he needed to depend on himself and god says you forgot me and i'm gonna give give you a forget me not i'm gonna show you that i'm with you in and out you might have ran out of sticks but son don't worry I am the God that created you delivered you I am your provider hide under the shadow of your wing don't go outside don't be moved don't be tempted when I say something I mean it and you can hide under the shadow of my word you don't have to be moved you don't have to when calamities come your way he says keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the tzitzit. Know that I've given my word, given my word that you might trust. So why? So why the woman? Why did she grab on? Said, I'm going to push through the crowd. I'm going to push through what people think. Yeah, I might make some people unclean, but I need him. So why did she go after the hem? Why did she say in her, in her heart, you know what? What I love about this story is she inspired others to touch the hem of his garment because it grew as an epidemic. It was a trend. It was trendy. <laughs> so why the woman? Why did she reach after that? Where did she get such an idea? Turn with me to the book of Malachi. The book of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. Also Malachi, whichever you prefer. Ma Malachi chapter 4. I'll, I'm going to start in verse 1. Listen to this scripture. So powerful. Where did she get an idea? Where did she get the courage to push through the crowd? Malachi chapter 4. For behold, the day comes. It shall burn as an oven and the proud. Yeah, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble and the day comes shall burn up says the lord host that it shall leave them neither root nor branch he's talking about a time to come that the messiah would come but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness stop right there the son of righteousness the the jewish people always taught that this would be the messiah the son s-u-n of righteousness 
This is the Messiah. When he would come. Now listen to what it says. Shall be the son of righteousness. His name shall be the son of righteousness. And will arise with healing in his wings. What? What just happened? But unto you that fear my name, the son of righteousness will arise. And there'll be healing in his wings. See, for the woman, she just didn't say, that's all I can reach. It wasn't something that she said, well, if I just barely get a piece of the garment. No, no, no. She said, I see him moving. And I see wings. And I think he's the one. He's the one that my grand, great grand dad talked about and my grandpa talked about and my father talked about and I remember reading this that when the Messiah would come his garments would be different his garments would not be the same when he came it said there'd be healing in his wings and so when she pushed through the crowd she just didn't say well if I barely make it if I could just barely brush his garment I'll be healed no 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 she said his zitzit is a place I'm going to go because the Bible tells me that his zitzits are going to have healing and I'm going in after him I'm going to go in after the promises of God I'm going to grab after what God said he would do if he's the one there'll be healing flowing out of those things and if I have to I'm going to push through the crowd and get to what he said and I'm going to grab on with faith and Jesus turned around and said guys I feel something flowing out of me and he, they looked at him and go you're nuts there's people touching you all over the place but he turns to him and says yeah but somebody touched something a little different somebody touched with faith they didn't want to just touch me they didn't just want to sit in the pew and say I'm glad I'm a Christian I'm glad I'm following Christ no no they grabbed on something with faith I felt virtue and power leave out of me there's somebody that touched me with faith that pushed through and grabbed onto a promise that was given to all men who will be the one who's ready who's ready to push through the crowd live above what the people are saying of you push beyond your sickness grab onto what God said because there's a lot of people touching Jesus following Jesus but they're not the ones going in after faith they're not the ones believing the promises of God who will it be will you be the one in the generation that rises up pushes beyond and says no matter what it takes I'm going to grab the promises of God. I'm not going to forget what he says about me. I'm not going to forget what he says about himself. I'm not going to forget that he's faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He have forever reigns. His promises are yea and amen. I did all that, and that's all I got out of that. That is something to shout about. That is something to say, you know what? I'm going to be like the woman. I'm going to take what God says and I'm going to start believing it. I'm going to start looking at his miracles and say, that's a promise to me. Nobody else is touching his tassels. I'm going in after it. If, if no one else is going to do it, I'm going to say that promise is for me and I'm not going to give up. I'm going to grab on to his word. I'm going to grab on to what he said is true. And I am not letting go until virtue and power flow from his word. It's under his wings that I'll find refuge. It's under his word and promises that I can find comfort. And I will not be moved. I will rest in who he is and who I am. Let us find healing in the borders and the power of his garment. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know it's not about the tzitzit today. It's not about this thing. There's no power in this. It is a reminder. It is a forget-me-not. It is a, a, a resemblance of what God is trying to do physically to teach you spiritual realities. There wasn't power in this. There was power in what? God and someone's connection in faith to take God's word and push through. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you, some of us in this room need to start believing God and start acting like we believe God. 
You know what? How she was able to push through the crowd? She had a belief, and that gave her a target, and that target gave her a goal, and that goal gave her power. That goal gave her confidence, and she was not willing to be pushed aside. I, we don't get the rest of the story, but I can tell you there was people looking at her going, get out of here, woman. Who do you think you are? You can't touch that man. You're unclean. We know who you are. Get out of the way. But no, no, no. She kept pushing. She kept going. She kept wanting what God said, and sometimes faith takes action. Ladies and gentlemen, if she sat at her home and goes, there's healing in his wings, there's healing in his wings, there's healing in his wings. <laughs> Yay! But no, she said, I know a rabbi that's walking around with some zitzit, and I heard that he's doing things like what was promised. I'm going to go find him. I'm getting out of my house. I'm getting out of my comfort zone. I don't care what people think. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you are sitting on your duff for far too long, and there's promises for you. Start rising up. Start living for him. Start doing what God said. You want a miracle? Start doing things that promote miracles. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? Start being the woman that says, I'm not going to sit there and hope for the best. I'm going to start reaching out. I'm going to start pushing. I'm going to start driving myself until I grab on to the tassel in which it was found. Healing and power. Some of you, God has been speaking to you about getting up and doing something. Those promises are yea and Amen. But some of those promises and miracles are going to take this and this and this. Is it you? Can I tell you one other story? There's knots in here and we could go through all the knots and they're tied and they're beautiful and there's knots and how they're held together. Let me read you a scripture. It comes from the book of Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk, and they shall not faint. Did you know this? that scripture alludes to this? Did you know the wait upon the Lord isn't wait? Did you know that word in Hebrew means to knot? To tie knots? Did you know that word means to tie knots? You know what that means? He's referencing this. He's saying, tie yourself with me. Hook up with me and tie yourself so tightly to me that I can't tell the difference. Not up. Those that wait upon the Lord, it's not just sitting there and waiting. No, no, no. It's saying, my whole life is tied and wrapped in him. Your strength will be renewed. You'll mount up as wings of eagles. And you'll be refreshed. Not your life. Take these today. Not your life in him. See how everything that you are, everything that he is, you're wrapped together and it's hard to see one from the other. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been determined for far too long. You've tried harder for far too long. You've pushed for far too long. It's time to notch yourself up with God and start remembering what he said. You can be all determined. There's great determined Christians out there. But tell you the honest truth, they're no more free today than they were yesterday. But there are people that are nodding themselves up with God, that are saying, my life is tied with you. I can't do this on my own. I am holding on. Your determination will not free you from sin. Oh, please say amen. amen. Your determination and your self-will will not, pulling up your bootstraps, will not overcome sin. You are only overcome by that sin already. Those that wait upon the Lord, that tie themselves with the Lord, and are free because of the power of the Holy Spirit, are those that are really free, and sin will have no power over you anymore. Please, recognize it's all about giving yourself over to Him and who He is. We have His Word. It's time to grab on, tie yourself to it. I'm sorry, but there's a reference big time. What about Bob? All I can think about is Bob up on the sailboat, tied onto that thing going, I am a sailor. I'm a sailor. How many of you have ever seen What About Bob? And he's tied on that thing, and he goes, I sailed, I am a sailor. 
And sometimes we just need to tie ourselves to God and nod up with God and go, I am a Christian. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not getting it all right, but I'm tied in for the ride. <laughs> Amen? We need to just believe him once again. These tzitzits are reminders. They're about his word that you'd not forget. It'd be a reminder that he is for you and not against you, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He is the God that heals thee. He is the God that provides. He is the God that sees. I could go on and on. And he says, I want to give you these so that you would never forget. There's no power in this. Just some strings. But they're a reminder of who he is that you would not forget. And then maybe today, today's the day you get freedom because you're ready to say, I'm willing to wait. I'm ready to take refuge under his wings. And I'm ready to not let go. These up here on this altar, they are for you. And in a few moments, I'm going to call you up, and I want you to grab one. But I don't want you to just come and grab one. I want you to come with anticipation. I want you today to step out of your seat and say, Jesus, I need a miracle. And I know there's no power in that. But Jesus, I'm going after the miracles. I'm going after your word. I'm going I'm to grab on like the lady grabbed on. And I'm going to believe for a miracle. And ladies and gentlemen, however, whatever you want to do with these seats, seats, that's up to you. Put them in your Bible. Hang them in a place that you'd see. Because that was what it was for. God created these not as emblems or, pow or like power or things that would you try to use as magic tricks. That's not what these were ever made for. They're not made for that. They're made as a reminder. Man messes things up. Man says there's power in these. That's not what he means. This is all about looking and remembering. It's a symbol for you to tie your life around him, grab on to promises, and hopefully you'll be reminded of the woman that pushed beyond her limits to grab onto a promise and found healing in the midst of the wings of the Messiah.